Hi, and welcome to today's episode of King's Conversations. Today, we're talking about the power of the creative industries in shaping our cultural landscape. I'm joined by Dr. Ruth Adams, a reader in cultural and creative industries here at King's College London. We're gonna talk about what is a culture war, ranging from topics from the Barbie movie to Harry Potter to Confederate statues. Hi, Ruth, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. So first off, can you just tell me what is a culture war? Well, um, a cultural war, depending on who you ask, <laughs> is a cultural conflict between two opposing ideologies or views or you know, um, ways of approaching the world, ideas about right and wrong. And some historians see these going back hundreds, if not thousands of years. But in the way that we're using it now, we generally date it back to a really influential work of sociology from 1991 by okay. James Davison Hunter. And he describes the battle for American soul as uh, a culture war. And he said this is two irreconcilable views about what is right, what is wrong. So it's, it's, it's a moral war between two opposing positions. And what can those positions be? Is it something like strictly just religion or is there lots of different types of viewpoints that would pertain to a culture war? Religion would be one of them, certainly. But um, for example, in the, in the contemporary context, we have um, ideas about sort of like trans rights uh, mm -hmm. versus uh, supposedly women's rights, whether those two things are in conflict, um, whether it's right to give um, women autonomy over their bodies or whether the, the rights of an, an unborn child should take priority over uh, a woman's uh, choice to what to do with her body. So in that context then, do culture wars change over time? Because I know rights change over time. So how does that influence culture wars in particular? They absolutely change over time. Um, and that's partly uh, a factor of societies changing. Um, one of the reasons that, that um, the uh, Institute of, of Policy Research here at King's argue that there's been a sort of an upswing in culture wars is that there's been massive demographic shifts um, in recent decades. And one of those really important shifts is that uh, certainly in the UK, um, around sort of 60%, I think, of, of young people now go to university. And that's, that's many times as many as their parents or grandparents. And the education that people get at university tends to make them much more sort of liberal about social issues. So you end up there with a sort of like a, a generational shift. And people in the older demographics may feel that the, that the world is moving too fast for them and they can't keep up. So they're resistant yeah. to changes in sort of like, like for example, being asked to use uh, different pronouns or different words to describe people of color. Um, and they may be resistant to that. Um, and that may stem from, from inherent sort of uh, prejudice, but it also may stem from um, anxieties that, that, that the world is sort of like moving away from them, getting away from them, and that they're that their ideas are no longer the sort of like the dominant common sense ideas that they believe them to be. Yeah. And so I know you've mentioned a couple of examples of culture wars. What would you consider currently like a good case study of a culture war? I think trans rights is probably a, a really dominant um, culture war in the UK and the US at the yeah. moment, perhaps not so in, in other places so much. Um, and one of, the, one of the reasons that we can sort of characterize it, I think, as, as a culture war is that we see it a great deal in the media, but it's also become a talking point for politicians. It's not just something that's happening in sort of like public or media discourse. It's actually, actually shaping policy that will have a, a definite impact on people's lives. Yeah. And when you say media, a lot of times when I think of media, I might think of my social media or the cinema. What other types of media are included in the perceptions of culture wars? Yeah, well, I think media has proliferated, and this is another yeah. <laughs> reason for the amplification of, of the culture wars, because, you know, not so long ago, I mean, certainly when I was, when I was growing up, we had uh, three public access TV channels. Yeah. <laughs> we had, you know, and we had newspapers, and that was about it. And now, of course, we have, we have um, hundreds, if not thousands, of, of, of yeah. TV channels, um, we have, we still have newspapers, but um, the online uh, news uh, access has increased um, enormously. Yeah. And through things like social media, um, 
it's very easy just to get uh, news and opinions that reinforce the ones that, that you have yeah. or to be led down sort of like particular sort of like ways of thinking by social media and social media algorithms. Yeah. So people's thinking can be shaped in, in very distinct and polarised ways um, and they may not get access to, uh, to different points of view. Yeah. Or that they may not find their views challenged within, within their sort of particular social grouping or through the, through the media that they access or choose to access themselves. Yeah, it kind of creates that echo chamber we hear a lot about where you stay in your bubble because you're not being challenged by opposing viewpoints or you're seeking out viewpoints that just realign your own, um, which I know we see a lot of, especially in the United States where... Yeah, and I think with, with a lot of social media, the, the interactions are, are very brief and they lack nuance, and I think that can amplify the sort of the polarization of, of debates as well. Yeah, and with the polarization of debates... Do you think the growth of media, as you've mentioned, has intensified culture wars? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, because because it's it's sort of like it's literally in your face. Yeah. All the time. You know, every time you you open your phone or your laptop or switch on the television or the radio, um, you're going to be hearing something about a controversial um, issue or or point of view. Yeah. And do you think that is just going to continue, or is there like a way to tackle that necessarily? Um. I think it's very early days in terms of digital media, and I don't necessarily think that we've um, caught up with it um, yet. So I'm not sure that we're necessarily very good at using social media in ways that might be more progressive. But on the other hand, I mean, if you use social media, if you do step out of outside of your bubble, social media is a fantastic way to learn about other people, other kinds of people, other points of view, yeah. other sort of like... Um, political arguments I mean it, it can be a sort of a massive learning resource yeah it's like I guess in the way that you utilize it can either be really constructive or really destructive <laughs> yeah and I think that is partly caused by the sort of like the algorithmic nature yeah of, of 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 social media and digital media and if people say things that are controversial people click on those even if they vehemently disagree with what that person is saying, yeah, because because that 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 sort of like um, triggers an interest, absolutely in them. And really, as far as the the digital media companies are concerned, they don't really care whether people are interacting with material because they feel positively about it or because they feel negatively about it. Yeah. as long as they are interacting with it and making use of their their services. Yeah, that makes me think a lot of we hear the term clickbait, and a lot of things might be published in a more polarized way in order to drive traffic. Um, how do you feel like that kind of clickbait trend has affected culture wars and like the polarization of different sides? I think it's sort of massively affected, um, you know, sort of more mainstream media as well, because it's a yeah. much, it's a much bigger um, media landscape now. And, and every sort of like outlet is competing yeah. for people's eyes and ears all of the time. So I think, you know, headlines that are not even necessarily representative of a story, but are likely to sort of like, you know, provoke people's interests, yeah. even sort of like respectable newspapers and mm -hmm. um, broadcasters will use those kinds of clickbait uh, headlines to drive traffic yeah. on, onto their websites because, because they, they, they need the traffic and they need the sort of like usually the advertising money that, that, that follows with that. Yeah. And that makes me think of, you know, like a lot of the contrarian commentators, like a Piers Morgan, for instance. Do you think that these media personalities and even like media companies need to take responsibility for how they shape culture wars? I think they absolutely need to take responsibility <laughs> yeah. for how they shape culture wars. But but what the what might be sort of like adequate sanctions um, is is not clear. I mean, there have been a few people that have um, said things considered to be so outrageous that they've dropped off the media landscape but they're few and far between yeah um and even if sort of mainstream broadcasters like the bbc or itv consider these broadcasters to be not not um not on brand yeah. shall we say there are other um smaller or more more specialist broadcasters that, that will pick them up and r really want what they have to offer 
in yeah. terms of uh, driving traffic and creating headlines for for their book for those outlets. Yeah, and I think something that at least I feel like I've noticed, especially coming from the United States, is there's a polarization. But then sur- sometimes with media coverage, that polarized end becomes more normalized. For instance, like a Donald Trump, that behavior that used to be seemed so polar is a little bit more normalized as he was, you know, the president of the United States. How do you think that comes into effect where things that were once really polar are now getting a lot more media coverage and might be coming closer to the normal viewing as normal, even if it's not? I think it is normalized. And and actually, I also think it's probably not representative of most people's views because yeah. because when when they do polling on public opinion, most people are sort of like in the middle yeah. of things. I mean, the people that, that, that sit on the sort of like the, the extreme ends of of uh, opinions on issues are are a minority, I yes. think, but they're a very vocal yes. minority, and they and get the they most can attention. Be a very organised yeah. minority, particularly on social media. So we have the idea of sort of pylons that if somebody yeah. says something that is regarded as controversial by by one group, they can organise a lot of sort of like comments yeah. and and takedowns of that comment, um, which make. Um, which makes some people very reluctant to speak out yeah. in public because they really don't want to have to deal with that sort of barrage mm-hmm. of, of negativity. Yeah, and I know with culture wars and this polarization that there are a lot of myths surrounding it, one of which is that culture wars is a passing trend. It's something that we don't really need to worry about. What, what do you think about that? Uh, for the time being, I think it's something we do absolutely need to worry yeah. about. Uh, because it has become such a dominant feature of media. And I think it's also become um, really sort of now increasingly sort of a part of uh, what we m- might term mainstream politics. Yeah. So so governments and, and parties that would like to be in government are increasingly using the sort of like the, the issues and, and the, the language, the discourse of culture wars mm-hmm. in talking about their their sort of policy approaches. Yeah, and I think another myth that we hear a lot too, kind of going back to this like polarization of the culture wars is creative expression is immune to political ideologies. Um, How do you feel about that in terms of, are they immune? Is there ever anything immune to political ideologies? I I think very little is immune to political (laughs) ideologies. I think certainly sort of, uh, for example, in the modernist period, there was this idea that you could create a pure art that was art for art's sake and that was completely sort of like unsullied yeah. by, by the sort of like the, the real world or, or um, you know, political opinions and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, that um, isn't really how the real world works and there are, nothing can be sort of like accessed in a vacuum. Yeah, absolutely. So if, even if you're looking at a work of art that is intended to be sort of like pure and yeah. and without politics without ideology you are bring, bringing to that work of art all of your life experience yeah all of your perceptions all of your prejudices so there's 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 always going to be um it, it's always going to be sort of like um a factor in it you know and also the, the context in which you access um yeah culture and uh, the creative industries will also shape your your understanding of it and your reception of it so yeah. n- no e- even if something is even if something is created with the intentions of, of sitting outside yeah. of politics um uh, the, the real human um, culture and society is is messy and, yeah. and everything is connected so i think it, i think it's naive to, to believe that that, that that can be the case. Yeah, so how do you feel when a newspaper tries to say like, oh, this is an unbiased, like middle of the road newspaper? Do you think that's ever the case? <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, and I, I don't think it's necessarily sort of like a, a, a bad thing to come from a particular perspective, but I think um, being transparent about, about the, 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 the beliefs or the, or the ideas that shape a particular interpretation of of events is 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 really necessary. Yeah, because I think um, transparency, that, as we as academics try to do, to be yeah. transparent about you know. So if we're making a feminist 
analysis of a film that we, w- we will say that we are doing, doing so. Yeah, because I think transparency a lot of times leads to constructive dialogue. When you know where something might be coming from, then you can engage with it more constructively. Um, and I think one of the other big myths around culture wars is that social media is never a good place for constructive dialogue. Um, that you're either going to be in your echo chamber or it's going to be very divisive. How do you feel about that? Um, I think, like I said, I think we're we're um, learning. <laughs> I think the technology is happening quicker. Yeah, absolutely. Than, than, than the, the culture and society is in, knows how to to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but maybe that's something we can learn. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing with you know the notion of uh, unbiased reporting is that. Um, you know, the idea that if you give both sides, that's unbiased, when actually not both sides are not necessarily equal in, yeah. in particular yeah. arguments. I don't think it would be appropriate, for example, to offer both sides of transatlantic slavery and the history of yeah. that, for example. Yeah. Um, there are historians that would argue for that. I, I, would, I would suggest that that's uh, wrong and, and inappropriate. And actually, there are... Um, the, the the stories of of sort of like oppression and wrongdoing um, n- need to take sort of priority to the yeah. supposed benefits of of such historical events. So I know you mentioned a lot about you know a feminist perspective, and we actually have a student question that I think ties into that very well, uh, which I'm going to play right here. With all of the discourse surrounding the new Barbie film, how does this relate to culture wars, and is it a culture war? I think the discussion around Barbie has been really interesting. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the interesting things about it is that it shows how there are different cultural and political sensitivities in different places. Because yeah. clearly it's a movie that's been released uh, globally mm-hmm. uh, in the UK and the US. Most of the discussion has been about its uh, feminist content, mm-hmm. about whether it is uh, anti men, yep. um, whether it is um, you know hostile to to men yep. um, in its critique of of the patriarchy. Although feminists would be keen to point out the patriarchy and men are not the same thing. And actually, one of the one of the messages of of the film is is that men are also the victims of of patriarchy, and it's not good for um, any of us. But it's it's a satire. It's yep. about dolls and. You know, it is exaggerated for effect and for, you know, for for comedic value. Yeah. Um, but I think there are some serious messages there, and I think the sort of like the inversion of the real world and Barbie world um, do flag up some quite interesting sort of issues. Yeah. Um, but yes, it has been seen as uh, anti men. We've seen a lot of sort of like commentators um, like Ben Shapiro. Mm-hmm. Um, Elon Musk, uh, Andrew Tate being very critical yeah. of, of the movie, um, and also some um, commentators here, including some, some female commentators, like, mm-hmm. like, uh, like the journalist Sarah Vine. Um, uh, I, but in other places, uh, the other issues have been, been different. So for in v- Vietnam, for example, the film was banned because of a map that was seen as, as problematic in its depiction of... of um, of, of China and, and, and China's control over parts of the world, even though it was a sort of a little cartoon yeah. cartoon map. Um, and that was also picked up by, by some right-wing politicians in the States who accused mm-hmm. it of being Chinese communist propaganda. Um, then we have sort of like discussions about whether it is sort of woke washing, whether, you know, Mattel is able to, by sending itself up in this way, is able to present itself as actually, you know, a very nice ethical company and not a company that has sort of like, you know, contributed to sort of issues of, sort of uh, you know, body dysphoria and filling landfill with plastic. Yeah. Um, so that's an issue. And then um, in other places, it's been seen as problematic in terms of um, whether it's uh, indecent um, and whether it is considered to be too um, pro LGBTQ plus culture, even though there are no actually sort of yeah. um, out gay characters in in the entire yeah. film. 
So it, it picks up on, on sort of different sensitiv- sensitivities within, yeah. within sort of like uh, culture wars in different places. Well, I wonder too, I know you mentioned the idea of, is it anti-men? But I know a lot of conversation around it is it's pro-woman, but does that inherently make it anti-man? And how does that then shape a culture war? Like, do those always have to be at odds? Or can you, like, be pro-woman and not necessarily be, like, anti-man? Like, some of the critiques of the Barbie movie have suggested. Yeah. No, I mean, it's 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 not anti-man. It's anti- anti-patriarchy. Yeah. It? Um, but I think in, in some um, corners of, of the media and particularly digital media, mm-hmm. that that discussion has become very polarised. And with the um, with the rise of, of what has been called the, the, the manosphere and incel culture and influencers like, like Andrew Tate, yeah. um, anything that is perceived as being sort of pro-women is, is interpreted as being sort of anti-men. Yeah. Because the discourse that they are promoting is that, that men are currently sort of in, inherently um, disadvantaged yeah. by contemporary society and that, that sort of feminism um, is, is, is an evil and uh, divisive ideology. Yeah, well, and I think that kind of, I feel like, also relates back to the clickbait we were talking about is influencers like Andrew Tate and such, where they use a lot of really divisive language. They get a lot of traffic, mm-hmm. but maybe not yeah. good tra- traffic. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, mean, I mean, it'd be interesting to know what... Um, you know what? What genuinely sort of like Warner Brothers and Mattel's response is to yeah. to that that because you know there is an argument to say that all publicity is good publicity. True, yeah, and <laughs> and all of it is is creating a hype yeah. around the film, and it's a hype that those companies don't actually have to pay for. Yeah, it's you know it's viral viral hype, yeah. which is is often a lot more sort of powerful, yeah, than, than you know paid for marketing. And do you think? I know some of the commentary around the Barbie movie is like, oh, it's woke or along those lines in that type of terminology. What, what is, what even is woke? Like, what does that mean in a culture war? Yeah, I think the word, yeah, the word woke is, is banded around a lot. Yeah. Um, And it's, it's a word that, that really needs sort of like critical examination. Mm -hmm. Um, The roots of, of woke are um, within sort of um, civil rights movements. Yeah. Um, it's it's a word that that has its origins in black popular culture. Mm-hmm. We can date it back um, really almost as far as the beginning of the of the twentieth century. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was um, to African American culture, and it was um, uh, literally a wake up call yeah. to, for black people telling other black people to be awake, to be conscious about oppression and racism. And in particular, um, um, issues like lynching and police brutality. Mm-hmm. And more recently, with the emergence of the Black Lives Matter yep. movement, um, the word has become much more uh, mainstream. But it's also been sort of appropriated, like yep. much, of, much of black popular culture, yeah. um, by society and culture more generally, yeah. to become um, a word that's used as, as a catch-all for uh, people who are or consider themselves to be alert to social injustice mm-hmm. and who are against that kind of social injustice, who want to call it out, who want to, um, you know, sort of make a place in society for people that are, yeah. are, uh, are of, from ethnic minorities who are um, gay, uh, trans, disabled or different in lots of yeah. different ways. Um and it's also been appropriated by the political right mm-hmm. to be used as an insult. And actually, interestingly, left and right use it pretty much in the same to mean the same thing. But when um, people describe themselves as woke, they 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 you know this is a positive yeah. affirmation. But it's also used as as a pejorative to diminish people's uh, claims for social equality. Or to diminish the the support that, that other people are offering marginalized groups for for greater equality and representation. Yeah, and I feel like that kind of makes me also, in a way, think of cancel culture. And how do you think that also ties into all of this? Yeah, 
I mean, yeah, cancel culture is another word that, that sort of like banded around a bit. And it's, yeah. um, but it's really hard to see that um, a lot of people who claim to be victims of cancel culture yeah. actually are because we hear them talking a lot yeah. about how they have been cancelled, yeah. for example. Um, so, I mean, one, one really sort of like um, big example, I guess, would be J.K. Rowling yeah. and, and the, yep. the controversy around her, um, her, her views or her stated views or about um, uh, trans people, trans women in mm -hmm. particular, um, and her support for... Um, other activists and, and and writers and academics who have been perceived uh, rightly or wrongly to be sort of trans transphobic. Yeah. Um, and this has created um, um, a lot of sort of disquiet, particularly amongst Harry Potter fans who regarded mm -hmm. her books as being um, real sort of beacons of inclusivity. Absolutely. And have found themselves to be very disappointed, to say the least by her stated yeah. views um, about, about these issues. Um, so, but whether, you know, and there are claims that she has been cancelled because people have said, oh, I'm not buying her books anymore. Yeah. I'm not spending any more money. Daniel Radcliffe and Emma Watson have come out and affirmed the identities of trans yeah. people mm -hmm. um, and whether she has been, you know, cancelled as a consequence. But, you know, she's still on social media. She's still, still earning a lot of money. Um, <laughs> the same, you know, might be said for other people that have yeah. been sort of like cancelled. They might have been removed from from one job. Um, Piers Morgan, for example, that he walked out on his job, yeah. you know, may claim that he's been cancelled because of his controversial views. But he still has a chat show. He still has a Twitter account. Yeah. So he's still very much a sort of a public figure and his opinions are getting... Um, you know, a, a public airing, it's much more likely that, um, you know, when um, more vulnerable, less powerful people call out the behaviour of the powerful, that they are likely to be the ones that are cancelled because they don't have the sort of like the um, the heft, the the uh, following to, to sort of kick back against, against that. Yeah. And I know we talked about culture wars evolving. It sounds like these words might slowly continue to evolve as culture wars evolve too. For sure. I mean, language is always evolving and, yeah, it, and it, will, it will shift according to, you know, to whatever the sort of like the needs and priorities are of, of, of a culture or a society at any given time. So going back to the J.K. Rowling thing, I know I'm a huge Harry Potter fan and I know when that all happened, there was this huge movement of, well... I love Harry Potter. That was really important to me in my childhood, and it was my safe space, but I don't support the author. Can you separate the author from the work or, like, from the art? I, I think it depends. And I think, you know, clearly a lot of uh, Harry Potter fans have invested hugely yeah. in, in the Potter universe, and they've invested emotionally yeah. in, it, in it hugely. So it will be felt as a, as a bereavement to let that go. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if, if people are able to make that separation and feel comfortable with it, then um, then who am I to say yeah. not? Um, but I also think it depends on how how visible, I guess, the, the sort of like the the author is with, within the work or the, or the artist, yeah. you know, because there's been lots of sort of like issues where, um, you know, sort of like... Um, artists, pop artists, visual artists have been, um, you know, found to be sort of um, sexual predators, for example. Mm -hmm. And then what happens to the work that they, that they have produced, yeah. you know, do, or they were, they held, you know, really sort of like objectionable views about, yeah. uh, about racial minorities, for example. So how, how do we deal with those? If, if, the, if that content is not actually in the work, yeah. can we still enjoy the work? Yeah, uh, and I I don't really have any any clear answers to that. I think that's probably something that people have to work out for themselves. But I also think it depends how much as we as a society value that work. Yeah, um, because there have been some pop stars that have been you know that that were um, convicted as sexual predators, and and their work has kind of disappeared without a trace. Yeah, but that might be seen as sort of like slightly marginal work. Mm -hmm. anyway but but work that is very much um 
part of the, the sort of the canon, if you like, and very yeah. much part of people's lives. They may be sort of like willing to overlook, you know, some some questionable aspects if if they find enjoyment and meaning in the work, and yeah. they may be able to um, interpret that work in, in a way that is sort of like meaningful and and liberating for them, even if the views of the author are, are pretty pretty at odds with with yeah. their own sort of perspective. Well, and kind of talking about that separation, you know, we're talking about the author from the art or the artist from the art. What about the art from the history? So statues, for instance, in the United States, we have a lot of Confederate statues and we're slowly starting to see a big movement to take those down uh, and like not glorify that part of our history. Uh, how do you feel about that kind of like separation? Can you separate the art, like the statue from the history behind it? Yeah, I think I think that's, that's a really interesting question. And I think also... Um, a, I think we need to make a distinction between sort of like sculptures and and and, uh, and statues. Yeah, fair enough. Because um, sculptures um, may be made by sort of like questionable artists, Eric Gill, for example. Yeah. Um, the sculptures that are on the outside of of a broadcasting house. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of discussion about those because he was um, a sexual predator. Yeah. Um, but they're beautiful sculptures. You know, they're part of that building. They're an mm -hmm. iconic part of that building. Um, and are they sort of so tainted by association that they should be gone? Yeah. Um, but they're not sculptures of Eric Gill. They're not celebrating him. They're, they're yes. by him. But statues are, generally speaking, put up to celebrate particular events or yeah. particular people. Mm -hmm. they, they commemorate. They, they celebrate. So if we, um, you know, the taking down of the statue of... Ed Colston in Bristol, for example, yeah. who was um, gave a lot of money to the town, and that's why lots of things in the town are named after him, um, and that's why the sculpture was put up. At several hundred years after he was living, that it was not put up at the time yeah. uh, in, in his lifetime. Um, that becomes, you know, do we need statues that celebrate people who bought and sold slaves? Yeah. Do we need statues of people who fought you know for the right to own slaves yeah. in the American Civil War I mean I, and I think that's a big question and the other question is that if we take those statues down which personally I think we probably should um, how you tell those stories um, they're critics of of removing statues will say it's erasing history it's not erasing history it's taking down statues yeah but how do you find ways to tell that history so yeah. things are not lost? Yeah, so it's like instead of glorifying that history, but we don't want to erase it. We want to remember it because, you know, if yeah. you forget history, you repeat it. Yeah, so. I mean, actually having statues of Colston and naming things after Colston in Bristol uh, was much bigger erasure of history mm -hmm. than taking that statue down yeah. and starting a conversation about where that money came from. Yeah. And not only his money, but lots of other people who were um, giving money to good causes that they got from, from trading in human beings. Yeah. Thomas Guy, who's, who was one of the founders of Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital. Yeah. That's where he made quite a lot of his money. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, so you know, m most sort of like um, big sort of historical organisations and um, are, are implicated yeah. in, in these issues because so much money came from the transatlantic slave trade. Yeah, absolutely. And then I feel that just continues to contribute to the polarization because different people have very different viewpoints about how we handle that kind of erasure, if yeah. you want to call it that. Yeah. Um, or even the calling it an erasure is in a way like polarization because that's not everyone's viewpoint of yeah. that action. Mm-hmm. Yeah, is it a race or is it open, actually opening up yeah. a dialogue about, about difficult history? Yeah, well, and again, if we don't learn from our history, we're going to repeat it. So <laughs> thank you so much for being here today. This has been such an interesting conversation about culture wars and the polarization of society. So I thank you so much, Ruth, um, for joining us here on King's Conversations. Thank you for having me.